When you work in this field, you meet a lot of amazing people. And some of them are amazing because of the work they're doing. Some are amazing because they're so willing to spend their time with you, to exchange ideas with you. I hope you all meet those people while you're at SOCAP. I'm excited to bring to the stage two people who I absolutely cherish every minute I get to spend with them. I've learned more from Fran Siegel over the last five years than just about anybody else. And Ariane I've met more recently, but is someone who's always thoughtful, always wants to hear a good question. And the benefit of having them both up here is not because they're wonderful people, but also because Ariane is one of those people who has found that magical space where financial return and impact are not compromised. He's running a very successful fund called Core Innovation Capital, and I'm excited for you to hear from them the way that works, the way Ariane thinks about this work, the impact that he's having, and all of the other topics that they're going to fit into the next few minutes. So please welcome Fran and Ariane. Can you hear me? I'm Fran Siegel. I am Chief Investment Officer of Impact Assets, which is a nonprofit financial services firm focused on increasing the flow of capital to impact investing. And I am delighted to be in dialogue with Ariane Schutte, who is a founder and managing director of Core Innovation Capital. Just, we wanted to kind of contextualize uh, our discussion for a moment. Um, you've heard this morning a fair amount about um, about mainstreaming and about incumbents entering the field, uh, institutions putting capital to work. And uh, Ariane and I are both really passionate about democratizing, about making financial services, making impact investing available to all, to the retail investor. And so uh, we hope that we can offer a, a slight point of contrast to some of the other speakers this morning the other thing is, we talked a lot about the supply side of capital, so drawing more capital into the space, whereas Ariane's work um, and his partner, uh, Kathleen, his business partner, Kathleen, uh, put, put money to work. And so we'll be talking about impact entrepreneurs, not just the supply of capital, but also uh, the demand for capital. So uh, a first kind of opening salvo um, is uh, the core innovation uh, invests in companies that serve the domestic unbanked and underbanked. So I'm wondering if you could talk about um, what that market is and uh, quantify it if you can, and talk about uh, why the sector is growing. Sure. So thanks, Fran, and uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I kind of came to this uh, after reading a book about a guy named Mohammed Yonas, uh, and he was new to me, and microfinance was new to me. I'd spent a decade building educational software in a bunch of venture-backed companies, and uh, I was just really genuinely blown away with what they'd done. Uh, and I'm an immigrant here myself, and so I didn't want to go to Bangladesh or India, and I was really interested and kind of inspired when Al Gore was sent packing when he went to visit India and talked about global warming, and they said, you come from the biggest polluter, uh, go back home and fix your own backyard. Uh, and so I've been really inspired to, to do what we can from our side to fix our own backyard. Uh, so I went looking for who's doing this kind of stuff in the United States, and I found myself in the south side of Chicago um, visiting with the founders of Shorebank. For some of those who, uh, who know about Shorebank, uh, they've, from their little corner of things, done an incredible amount to really advance... Uh, community development and financial inclusion, not just in Chicago or in the United States, but really globally. Um, and so, while on one hand I was really like deeply inspired by what they'd built, uh, I also looked at what that community had done in terms of scale. And after about 40 or 50 years, the community development movement, um, while it has done remarkable things in local neighborhoods, if you add it all up and look at it from a United States perspective, is serving about one-half of 1% 1 of the population. And so it hasn't scaled particularly well. And so one aha was, gosh, there's incredible work, very powerful, uh, important and powerful work going on, but it hasn't scaled at all. And so when you look at the United States, right, the income divide is growing, uh, and that represents a dire policy uh, problem. Uh, many, many tens of millions of customers 
uh, underutilize traditional banks and overutilize alternatives. Those alternatives are extremely expensive. Uh, it's expensive to be poor, uh, as it sadly turns out. Um, and uh, so this is also a, a dire need. Um, and, uh, but there's also a flip side to it. And that is that is not just a need, it also is an incredible opportunity. And so as we started looking at how do we reframe this as an opportunity, right? you start looking at, at it from a revenue perspective. Uh, and so uh, the, the need that we have around financial security for low-income people in the United States and financial mobility for low-income people in the United States actually represents about $100 billion on annual revenue that low-income people spend on very basic financial products. All products that probably almost everyone in this room gets for almost free. Uh, and so no matter how empathetic we all may be, we basically live in a bubble, and it is hard to imagine uh, the incredible expense that is incurred by an incredible number of people who live all around us. Uh, and so looking at it through a market lens was really the aha that led to the creation of CORE and to the thesis of investing in financial services companies that could serve low-income people at scale to the tunes of tens of millions as opposed to hundreds or thousands or maybe tens of thousands uh, and do so in a way that is profitable uh, and uplifting for them economically. Mm -hmm. I spoke yesterday in a, in a session with Kathy Clark about... Uh, how focused I am on uh, the microfinance movement and global sustainable agriculture lending in emerging markets. And you touched on this a little bit, but, but how uh, those markets in some ways from a lending perspective are ahead of the United States. And what can we learn uh, from microfinance and global sustainable agriculture, which really look at the rural poor and the urban poor uh, as strong credit risks, and what can we do to help build uh, the credit rating of, of folks at the bottom of the pyramid? And um, just wondering if you can kind of elaborate on that. You have roots in, in both microfinance and uh, community, community banking, but it just occurs to me in the wake of the financial crisis and um, subprime lending that uh, the low to moderate income folks have kind of gotten a, a, a bad rap, in some ways worse than ever before. And so can you talk a little bit about those, some of those market factors? Yeah, so clearly there's a lot to learn uh, from what's happening around the world. And in many very important and annoying ways, the United States is antiquated and behind uh, from its financial services offerings. Uh, however, we've, and I've, I've been scouring for a decade now to find ways to translate what's happening abroad and apply that here. It's, very, it's been very hard to do that in many cases, literally, uh, because the, fin the, inf the financial services infrastructure in the United States is so different. Uh, there are other places in the world where they are similar, like South Africa or Brazil are more similar than, uh, the, or, or the UK or the EU uh, than many other places, um, but it's hard to replicate literally. And so what, what, but where there is tremendous uh, power and, uh, lessons from abroad to be applied here is more metaphorically speaking. And so, for example, this notion of a social collateral is something that the United States barely utilizes. So there's about 70 million Americans who don't have a FICO score. And that doesn't mean that they are subprime or irresponsible. It just means that there isn't the data in TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian that create a FICO score. And so they're invisible. Um, and so it's a continuous challenge for the United States financial services system to underwrite this customer accurately, so they're not risk adjusted. They're basically treating all of these thin file or no file customers as subprime customers at their detriment. Uh, and so the microfinance world, for example, has figured out very powerfully how, how you use your community and your friends and your loved ones and the notion of shame, for example, to decrease uh, defaults. That is hardly utilized in the United States and is a very powerful idea. Uh, and one of our portfolio companies is actually trying to do that in a very modern way. So we invested in a company called Vouch. Uh, and Vouch is trying to be an alternative to a payday loan. 
payday loan famously costs three-digit APRs. It's easy and uh, to get uh, you know riled up about that at a cocktail party, um, but uh, Vouch is trying to uh, address the same customer at one tenth the price of a payday loan, uh, largely by helping people leverage their social collateral. So uh, helping the lender, Vouch, basically determine uh, the, the resilience of someone's character. And character is really hard to define. Uh, and so they basically allow you to uh, engage your social community to vouch for you, to sponsor you. You can either say, Fran, I think you're responsible and be a kind of a soft vouch. Or I could, if you're trying to borrow $5,000, I could say, I'll back you for 100 bucks. And you could get 10 people to back you for 100 bucks. It's kind of like a cosign. And that's a very modern online translation of a very old idea, right, that's existed in microfinance for a long time and, and in, you know, more old fashioned forms of borrowing for millennia before that. Mm -hmm. So as an example of how, of, of how we're kind of metaphorically importing some ideas from abroad. So I, I think of the kind of investing you do at core as kind of fintech for good, for fintech for impact. There's been a lot of discussion around fintech. It's, it's quote unquote super hot right now. And, uh, and, and how do you see yourself fitting within the broader trend of fintech in, in serving this very particular constituency? Yeah, so we're unique in the United States in that we're a fintech investor that knows the sector well, but is decidedly interested in investing in companies that are economically empowering for low-income people. Uh, so we have a, an angle on fintech. Uh, we play very nicely, I think, with the broader ecosystem. Uh, and by and large, we co-invest with mainstream investors. We'd love to co-invest with more impact investors, but I actually have none uh, as co-investors. But we do have Andreessen Horowitz or Greylock or Google or Venrock or Charles River and many others uh, as co-investors. Uh, who, who co-invest with us for a variety of reasons. Uh, they may not call it impact, maybe they call it reputation risk management, or maybe they, uh, it just gels with one of the partners, or maybe they see it as uh, you know, effectively increasing the enterprise value. Ultimately, if, if our thesis is right, we're able to align creating high impact and great returns uh, by investing in companies that are going to create long-term value on lots and lots of customers. And that ultimately translates to higher enterprise value. And it plays out in financial services that if you look at companies that are more predatory like companies that are publicly traded, you actually see that their enterprise value is relatively little on an EBITDA or, or, or revenue basis versus companies that provide much longer term value. And so that's how we're trying to marry these two ideas so that they're actually synergistic to each other as opposed to in conflict. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's move a little bit now, bridging to financial returns. Um, and uh, I, I, you, you probably know Aileen Lee from Cowboy Ventures, who famously coined the term unicorn, which is privately held companies that have uh, valuations of at least a billion dollars, and the list is growing of those. Um, and so I'm trying to coin uh, the, the phrase uh, impact unicorn. And an impact unicorn, is, and I think you invest in impact unicorns, where Hope the, so where uh, you can seek to achieve market rates of financial return as well as very, very strong uh, impact and that the financial returns are released because of and not in spite of the impact. Uh, but the true story of, of impact investing is that it's a spectrum uh, from return of principal to concessionary term to market rate and even premium rates of return. Uh, you have, have spoken specifically about this dichotomy of missionary to mercenary. And I was wondering if you could expand on that dichotomy and say where you think uh, CORE fits um, on that spectrum. Sure. Well, and I think of it as a spectrum and not a dichotomy. And it's kind of a, it's meant as a characterization which is meant to both insult kind of people at either end of the spectrum as a, as a stimulus to get them to think differently. And so... Right, I kind of see the spectrum as there are missionaries on one hand, uh, and basically the missionaries are 
uh, you know, we'll give lip service to the business part of it. They know they need to talk that language, but at the end of the day, they're really mission driven. Nothing wrong with it. Great, very courageous group of people. And there's mercenaries, which I also don't see as particularly wrong, and that's frankly most of society. And like, you know, these are not evil people, and you know, the good or the impact may be, you know, an afterthought or kind of, you know, the community section on their website or something like that. Nothing wrong with that. There's incredible philanthropic dollars and efforts you know and well-intended people who are on either end of the spectrum, but you know what I mean? And so from our perspective, as we look at entrepreneurs, the lion's share are in the mercenary category. A very small number of them are in the, in the missionary category, and we've found, sadly, that the missionaries, by and large, are not company builders. It's, the, it's difficult for them to raise the kind of capital they need to build the kind of scale that we think is important, um, even though we are agreed with their intentions. And the mercenaries basically don't care enough to build in uh, oversampling of value to low-income consumers and through their business models and to go through the heartache and the harder work to, to make business models that work or to create technology that, brings, that drives real efficiencies, like an order of magnitude type of efficiency where you're 10 times better than what there was there before. And so we look for what we call the visionaries, who are neither missionary nor mercenary, but they are, the, they are driven by the desire to really make deep impact, as Deborah referred to, uh, I like that framing, um, but they are uh, schooled and effective in the, in the, in the business of business. Uh, and those are, and, and often they end up being what we call a kind of accidental social entrepreneurs. They, many of them don't know what this is or who we are or what is this, you know, SOCAP and the SOCAPs of the world, um, but they care deeply. Uh, and so almost all of our entrepreneurs are accidental social entrepreneurs, and I think uh, we should all look beyond our, right, the, the converted uh, to see who are the people who can really take us to the next level, and many times they will not be uh, right here amongst us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving from financial returns to impact returns, um, it impact us as we largely invest in fund managers, and so we have a database of you know, 500, 600 firms that we follow, and we, we tend to invest in just a handful a year in the same way that you look at hundreds of deals and maybe only invest in a handful as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talk a lot in the space about aligning uh, impact with financial incentives. But the truth of the matter is, meaning that the, is the fund manager's uh, financial incentives aligned with the releasing of impact. And I will say that I have seen like very few of these in the wild. Uh, we, we, we all see it's, you know, it's a good idea, but you know, it's, it, it's very rare. And core innovation capital is one of the few uh, fund managers that, that do this kind of alignment. And I'm wondering if you can speak about that. Sure, so we're looking to make market rate returns. Uh, which in the venture space is actually very difficult because venture capital, for those of you who don't know, is actually a really crappy asset class. Uh, almost all, there's a power curve in venture, so almost all venture capitalists underperform S&P 500, uh, let alone get anything close to what people think of as venture returns. And so the notion of concessionary within venture capital, I think, is a bit of a, is a, of a misnomer because uh, it's discounting a already you know, discounted uh, median performance. So for us, the challenge was, OK, how do we combine these two? Uh, and how do we stay true to being high impact and delivering deep impact? And so we clearly have our toes to the fire in terms of creating great financial returns. And our LPs bug me about this every day or whenever they get a chance that we should be you know, like pushing that harder. We've tried to build in into our, into our inner fiber uh, into our general par partnership agreement and our limited partnership agreement, uh, also holding our toes to the fire to create great and scalable social impact. Um, and it's something that is unique and it shouldn't be. And it's something that I would love to see more in our industry, that we don't just rely on our good intentions. And everyone here is incredibly well-intentioned. But good intentions uh, are the road to, I forgot, but uh, you know, setting up an accountability mechanism 
is very important to help us execute highly against our good intentions. And so we've built this system by which we basically tie our compensation to our, not just our financial return, but our impact. Uh, and so when we underwrite a company, we look for a variety of impact metrics. How many low moderate income are they serving? Can they get to scale? Can they, get, can they reach millions? Are they providing, are they saving them something like an order of magnitude over the best alternative? And can they help the customer in the long term build assets, build credit, um, and, and find a pathway to the financial mainstream? And then every year, we create an objective report with data reported from our portfolio companies. We have a three-person impact audit committee that is independent from us, that scores us from one to 100, and that score equals 100% of our bonus and 10% of our carry. Uh, and, that, and it's broken down to a number of parts. And that practice, in very practical ways, has really helped us improve the way we execute against that. And so, you know, if we get a score of eight or seven or something like that in part of our, in part of our impact metric, w that is embarrassing, right? Like, that is not why we're doing this. We're doing this to be in the top 1%, mm -hmm. the top 5%. And so we've, we've made changes. And, you know, again, like, I don't need to be reminded why I'm doing this, but, like, having that mechanism is incredibly powerful, and it's mm -hmm. something that I would really like to see and encourage more people who are investing in funds or people who are managing funds to self-impose, right, to create a mechanism to follow Peter Drucker's kind of famous mantra of what, what's measured gets managed, um, to create excellence, not just in great financial returns, but social returns as mm -hmm. well. Well, thank you. Behold, ladies and gentlemen, an impact unicorn. <laughs> thank you.